As one of the most important bilateral ties in today's world, China-U.S. relations has been characterized by the integration of goods, capital, technology, and people for 40 years. And today, it is at a key crossroads, many believe. So how can the two countries engage in dialogue instead of conflict? I asked this question and many more to Neil Bush, founder and chair of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations the third of five children of President George H.W. Bush. For the past 25 years, Mr. Neil Bush has engaged in various international business development activities with a focus on China. He first visited China in 1975 when his father was the chief liaison officer representing the United States in Beijing. Since 1975, Mr. Bush has traveled to China over 140 times and has visited over 40 cities. Let's invite his wisdom. Mr. Bush, what a pleasure to see you. It really takes a lot of courage, one would assume, Mr. Bush, to once again accept our interview on a media based in Beijing, particularly when it comes to China-U.S. relations. Um, and I feel very comfortable with this topic. I'm not a foreign policy expert. I'm not an analyst. But I spent a lot of time in China over the past 40 plus years. And, um, and I've seen China's rise from a kind of a front row seat. I think I have a different perspective than most Americans because of my closeness uh, to, to China and my being a witness uh, to this incredible transformation over these past 40 years. You have a, a Bush Foundation on U.S.-China relations. If you look at the recent yes. U.S. media coverage, your family has been accused once and again of uh, soliciting money coming from the Chinese Communist Party. But in fact, you argue that, that it is a cooperation with a long-time uh, friendly uh, or association, uh, China-U.S. Exchange Foundation. Tell me more about yes. that. And how do you feel about this media, uh, shall I say, hype of the story? Yeah, first of all, um, the Bush China Foundation was formed, the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations was formed um, during my father's lifetime. He's had a, a passion for building better and closer ties between China and the United States. Um, and he, he believed at his core that having um, communication and, and dialogue and, and building understanding through respectful exchanges and that kind of thing, you know, were the way to go. Um, so with his blessing, we formed the, the Bush China Foundation. Um, one of our funders, we get funding from U U.S. companies and from Chinese, the Chinese side. In this case, the KUSEF, uh, the, the uh, China-U.S. Exchange Foundation, is run by C.H. Tung. C.H. Tung is an old family friend. He was, yeah. he was um, obviously a leader uh, of Hong Kong when the Hong Kong transition to China took place and did a fabulous job in that role. Yes. Uh, he cares deeply about the U.S.-China relationship, and the and KUSIF itself supports many, many you know uh, organizations, think tanks, and foundations throughout the world, and, and especially in the U.S. Um, he, he's a great guy, and I so I, there's nothing uh, we're not apologetic at all about receiving funding from C.H. Tung. Uh, the criticism of of us, which I haven't seen much of, frankly, it's a it's a there's a small cabal of folks out there that might be looking for things like this, but the criticism of us comes from a very narrow interest, um, interest that, that um, want to find, you know, find wrong in any, anything that, um, that is, you know, pro um, better understanding and closer ties. Because we already have this uh, pandemic for more than a year, so it's very hard for people from both sides to travel to one another and anywhere else in the world to meet. So uh, tell us more about your feeling. What is the temperature right now? Pretty obvious to me as, a, as, a, as a, an observer that the, that the feelings towards China, among the political elite especially, it, are, have become very toxic. Um, and I, I have a feeling there's a lot of polling out there, um, but it's a it's 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 very sad to me to see. I'm I'm, I'm hopeful that um, that this new administration 
you know, we'll, we'll move in the direction of at least establishing more regular dialogue, which leads inevitably to better understanding and a lowering of tensions. And so far, they're off to a much better start than the past, past administration, in my opinion. Uh, so we'll see where it goes from here. Five months already into the office, do you see that is happening or things are getting even worse? I think it's, I think it's, I think it's getting better. I think it's inevitably going to get better for this next three and a half years uh, for, uh, in the remaining term of Joe Biden. Areas that have been uh, identified for collaboration, the Biden administration has clearly stated there's areas where we compete. And instead of, you know, hype, uh, hyping or, or harping only on the allegations of China's um, abuses of the international economic system, you know, America is now gearing up to compete. We're starting to put money together to, to become leaders or to stay as leaders and to continue le to lead mm. in areas of technology, AI, and, and, and the various technologies that are, you know, kind of creating all kinds of opportunity in the future. So I think there's a lot of really good um, signs. There have been a lot of good signs coming out of the very first few months of this administration. My greatest hope is that again, through closer contact and dialogue, mm -hmm. that eventually, you know, we're going to see the political elite move to understanding that this relationship has been critically important over the past 30 years for our economic development in the United States. Right. It's helped to lift 600 million people out of poverty in China. Um, and so there's been a tremendous bilateral benefit to our relationship and that that and that with the world as close as it is today, as 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 connected as we are, that it would be a travesty to decouple or to enter into some kind of a Cold War phase or to try to, you know, I, I think I think the I political see. elite is going to see that the uh, that we're better off national security wise and economically by having having ties. However, Many here are wondering whether Washington today, with its complicated domestic politics, are trying to rally the country with the use of China, uh, even though very negative, uh, with an, in a negative way, uh, to, to rally the country to, to unite together because there's something called the China threat. Uh, and it might be useful for, for Washington, however, it is very unfair for China. Uh, Mr. Buller, uh, your thoughts? Is, this falls into the Thesudides trap argument, which if you've read Graham yeah. Allison's book. Talked to um, Professor Allison many times. Yeah, he, he, you know, the book is very, I would highly recommend it to my American, I do recommend it to my American friends. And even in I mean, the book, he suggests that, that it's important to learn the lessons of history and therefore to avoid it rather than repeat it. Yeah, of course, of course, and and we're 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 living in a modern era where it seems crazy to be moving towards conflict. I mean, we we're all adults, we're all mature, we live on the same planet, we we share a common humanity, and it doesn't make sense that we would want to, you know, to 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 establish an aggressive posture towards towards China or any other country uh, unless there's good cause to do so. And so that so you know it gets to the question of intentions, but. You know, the Thucydides trap suggests that as a country rises, the, the established power feels threatened. And then because of the fear of that rise, there are all kinds of propaganda and assertions and assumptions made about the intent of the rising power that lead to, to misunderstanding. And that, that miscalculation or misunderstanding in history has led to conflict. And, that, and, and we just need to avoid that. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried that the rise is being used, that China's rise and the fear of China is being used um, to help, you say, unify the country. I think it's more basic politics. I think it's more about getting reelected in the local district. You know, if, you, if you're a China basher, you know, that, that means you're against the communists and you're for democracy and for freedom, and therefore you're going to be the, you're, you know, I'm going to vote for you. No matter how much China showed gestures and made progress, it's not likely to change the political rhetorics inside Washington because they're going to continue to use that and they need that.
uh, for either their district elections or the midterm or eventually another presidential election. So that, that, that actually discouraged a lot of Chinese who, are, who have been very instrumental about this uh, relationship over the past decades. Mr. Bush. Yeah. No, I can imagine them being discouraged, but you know, there had been so much interaction and so much connectivity between China and the United States, between Chinese students, for example, who have come to America and returned to China, some have stayed. Um, but because of these interactions, business-wise, tourist-wise, you know, student-wise, you know, there's, there's going to be more and more, you know, understanding that establishes from basic human connection, you know, just from being in the same dorm as as a student from China, or, you know, when you interact with Chinese business people, the way I have over many years, you know, you get to see the, these individuals as humans that are, you know, like me, like you, like, uh, like us being kind and generous towards others and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I don't know. I'm hoping that the mm -hmm. political um, incentive or motivation will, will, will be dampened by the reality that, that this connectivity between China and the United States has, has it, you know, benefits, benefits all of us. And that is that there's not a threat, that we don't, we're not, you know, ex, ex, explicitly being threatened by China in any way. There are things that we're going to uh, harp about issues, and that's normal. That's a natural thing. Friends have disputes, and they resolve these disputes you know, through dialogue and better understanding. So, so it, it shouldn't lead to conflict. It shouldn't lead to, to, a, to a, a, you know, separation or decoupling or Cold War type and uh, outcome, you know, is the bottom line. We, we, we should be moving towards working together to solve major challenges and, and towards a universal understanding of what the rules are that need to be applied as we approach, you know, various, aspects of interact, interacting with each other and with other countries. We see a tendency, uh, in fact, among many major players in the world, uh, inside their domestic politics, trying to romanticize Cold War or uh, rivalry. Um, I mean, your family, uh, starting from your uh, father to uh, your brother and to, to you, I'm sure have all witnessed part of that history. And as a political, as a family with uh, quite a number of well-known politicians, how do they characterize Cold War? How do you understand Cold War? And if people are dragging you, us, to Cold War or the edge of it, what should we do? Yeah, it just seems crazy to enter into a phase of a Cold War. It doesn't make any sense. You know, if you think about this simple statistic, there are, in 2019, 100, there were 169 million outbound flights by Chinese, out, outbound, and it was defined as being anywhere from China, mainland China, 169 million, and this, there, some people travel multiple times, so I don't know, it's tens of millions of people, you know, were flying out. How can you have a Cold War where that many people are leaving and coming back to China all the time? You know, how can you have a Cold War where our economies are so, so deeply intertwined? And for, you know, for the trade war to have started under, under the last administration, it was crazy to suggest that we were going to bring jobs back to the United States. We were at full employment when the tariffs were put on. He says we're gonna, they claim they were going to create more manufacturing. We lost more manufacturing jobs. The trade deficit went up. The taxpayers or the, the, the consumers of the United States paid for those tariffs. Yeah. It was a stupid idea. And it was a step towards cold. It was kind of a step towards Cold War. But it was a step that was a misstep, clearly a misstep. And I'm hoping the Biden administration will see it as it was, as a mistake, um, because our countries are much better off, you know, not, not building a wall between us, but rather breaking that wall down, creating more transparency, enforcing rules as it relates to intellectual property protection and, and, and human rights issues and that, those kinds of things, 
and 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 where there are criticisms of the United States, we 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 address those as well. But we but we need to move forward together with walls being torn down rather than built. We I, I am an unabashed believer that globalization has helped America tremendously over the past. 40 years, especially the last 20 or 30 years. And our biggest partner in the world of globalization has been China. And to destroy that or to build a wall between us, to establish a Cold War type environment between us, is, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's so illogical to me personally. Mr. Bush, uh, I want to let you know that many here in China have been very reminiscent of the days when the two countries are having, were having constructive relationship with one another and be able to, at different stages, be courageous enough to face up to those challenges um, and be able to build the relationship even further uh, on top of those challenges. Uh, so that shows leadership. I really wonder, after you know, living in the same family with many of your leaders, uh, your father, your brother. To you, what is leadership? Political leadership, business leadership? Yeah, my leadership to me is about, you know, being respectful of others, l putting yourself in the other guy's shoes, mm -hmm. you know, bringing, cons building consensus around uh, what's obvious um, to be the right direction to go. Um, and, and, and sadly, politics interferes, you know, with, with, true leadership, statesmanship, statesmanship, statesmanship type leadership transcends politics. It, it says, I don't really care what people think at the end of the day. We're going to lead what they think by, by doing what's right. And my father, uh, every step of the way, did what was right. So I'm really proud of, proud of that. My brother George did the same. My brother Jeb, as governor of Florida, was an extraordinary leader um, in, in Florida. So yeah, I've had some pretty good role models for leadership. Tell me more about your family, uh, Mr. Bush. How much, and, and uh, your relations uh, with China, uh, personal relations. Uh, uh, when you grew up, uh, when did you travel to China? What was your impression? And, you know, what was your the last reason trip? I, way, the reason I have such strong feelings about China is that, that I was in China in 1975 when my father was quote unquote, the bicycling ambassador. Um, and I witnessed firsthand a China that is very, very different than today. And in fact, today's China was unimaginable in 1975. Um, and so the, the, the people in China were very friendly towards us. We were, there were very few long nosed white guys riding bicycles down the streets of Beijing. Was it fun when you were a little kid and riding the bicycle in Beijing? Do oh, you still remember great. the roads? Uh, which yeah. stretch uh, is the most interesting? Uh, which corner no, do you enjoy? Uh, we used to love riding our bikes, you know, down the main street to get to the, to, the to Tiananmen Avenue. Square, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it was great. We we had Peking duck. My dad established a great love for Peking duck. Mm -hmm. You know, he 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 just he really loved China, the Chinese people. You know, and that kind of thing. He, and, and since he, and since his retirement from the presidency, you know, to see China rise was something that brought him great joy. Not he, he, he my dad was never afraid of the China's rise. Looking forward to the day you and your whole family could travel to China again, and maybe Peking duck, yeah. maybe bicycles, maybe just talking to the friends. <laughs> In the I doubt I'd breeze. be riding too many bicycles. The streets are filled with cars. And I, <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be the same anymore. It, it might um, be different. Yeah. It might be different. I look forward. To, I'm definitely looking forward to coming back. It was such a pleasure talking to you. And many of your Thank friends, you, I'm sure, in China and beyond miss you here. And I'm sure that trip will be done, hopefully soon. Neil Bush, talking about his personal stories with China and what he believe is a strong commitment of he and his family in seeing China's rise. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Insight, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye -bye.